Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming in person and for visiting us online uh, for this presentation <laughs> by Drs. Dragan Gasevic and George Seaman. Uh, Dr. George Siemens is, Siemens is the professor and executive director of the LINK Research Lab. LINK stands for Learning, Innovation, and Network Knowledge at the University of Texas Arlington. He's also co-founder and president of the Society for Learning Analytics Research, or SOLAR. He's also one of the professors credited with teaching the first MOOC, uh, and uh, he's an expert in data analytics and just about everything uh, computer and learning related. And we're really proud to have uh, George and Dragon here. Dragon Gasevic is associate, he's a professor and Canada Research Chair in Semantics Learning Technology, Semantics and Learning, Semantic and Learning Technology, sorry in the School of Computing and Information Systems at Athabasca for another few weeks, uh, after which he will be moving to the University of Edinburgh, where he will be the chair of their new learning analytics uh, emphasis and lab there. Uh, I've gotten to know the two of them very well over the last couple of days, and I'm really uh, pleased to uh, share what they are doing with you, to uh, help them share what uh, they're doing with you. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Dragon and George. Thank you. Thanks. So I think you are kicking off right now. Ah, okay. So, I'll, all right. So one of the things that we want to start talking about here, or spend a bit of time on, is this idea of what's changing educationally and what's changing in terms of the kinds of tool sets that we're going to be using. It's probably not much of a surprise to anybody in the room here that the development of competency-based education seems to be accelerating and capturing the interest of a fairly broad group of stakeholders to the point where the U.S. Department of Education has initiated experimental site initiatives around the, uh, the use of competency-based education. There's a growing amount of software providers that are offering either a distinct platform, systems like LoudCloud, or, or existing uh, platforms that are beginning to add some kind of competency-based functionality into their system as well. So one of the things that we're going to talk about today is this idea of, uh, of a, a tool for managing competencies, but to do, uh, do so through a social lens, and perhaps most importantly, to do so through a lens of existing learning research literature, so that rather than fighting against what's happening educationally, we have a better sense of uh, what the needs of learners are, but also how we currently, in the field of learning sciences, uh, understand learning and effective learning practices. Now, the tool set we're going to be talking about is called uh, ProSolo. It's a tool set that initially started. It's something that Dragon led as a research initiative out of European Union uh, several years ago. Uh, in 2010, I believe, around that timeline, 2011, I started chatting with, with him about this initiative as well when he approached me about what they were doing with it. And the end result was ProSolo that you see here today. So there's three of us involved. Uh, there's uh, Dragon, myself, and Shane Dawson, and then a few programmers. So what we want to look at here is a few things about the context of why this, this is happening. We'll go into more detail on this during the afternoon session as well. But generally speaking, we're seeing the demand side of education increasing for really multiple decades, whereas the university didn't really respond effectively to it, even though there was a huge increase in learning needs as we entered this so-called knowledge age. And all of a sudden now we're at a stage where universities are saying, oh, wait a second, uh, there is, and MOOCs really precipitated this conversation in many ways, where suddenly there's enormous uptake of MOOCs, and initially it was a threat to the university, but now it's, I think, largely recognized as it's serving an entirely different marketplace. It's serving a marketplace of learners that, that universities really weren't aware of. So in a sense, there's been a shadow learning economy that's developed in society, and that's through a range of tools or technologies that are often user-driven and user-controlled. So there's a lot of value in this emergent space, but it's also something about the idea of a university that we need to, to look at how can we change or adapt this to something that's more relevant for today. So the growing demand of education is just reflected in a range of, of um, stats or a range of uh, reports that emphasize that a greater percentage of individuals in today's society enter education than ever before. Now, it's one thing to educate a group of people who are the brightest of society. So if you get a small percentage of society getting a degree, you're typically looking at the brightest, most motivated learners. Once you're approaching 50, even 60% of society entering education, you have a very different type of a learner profile, and you have to expand and broaden not just 
the pedagogical approaches that you're using, but also the ways in which you make it available to learners because you may not have the traditional student that sits in a classroom for four years as your primary uh, audience. And that's also reflecting the growth in the student diversity where if you're looking at the percentage of students right now that are spending uh, full-time educational time, it's now a minority in, in the U.S., meaning that there's a range of learners now that we're bringing into the university context that have other life commitments and other things going on. They're not full-time students. Again, there's, uh, if you're familiar with adult education theory, there are a, a broadening range of needs for those learners, a very different set of needs than what we have. So I guess to put another way, really the narrative of what higher education is is changing, and it's no longer a singular narrative that you go to school when you graduate, or you go to university when you graduate high school, and then from there you enter the labor force and that's what you do. And we're seeing instead a, a complexification of the higher education sector, and that has some fairly dramatic implications for the way in which we provide tool sets and resources to our learners. A lot of the tool sets that we're using now are essentially duplications of classroom mindsets meaning that we have the same teacher-centric perspective in a lot of cases. We have a heavy emphasis on the learners duplicate the knowledge that the teacher possesses and the teacher then assesses them or the faculty member assesses them against this body of knowledge that they've defined. Now, there, it's not exclusively the case. There's a few folks, I mean, if you're familiar with the work of Carl Breider and Marlene Scardmalia, they've certainly spent a lot of time talking about knowledge building and the value of knowledge creation processes. But the tool sets that we're using, though, don't reflect much of what we know within learning theory, learning psychology, learning sciences, and that's a bit of a challenge. So the educational landscape today has a range of different factors to look at, whether we're talking about students that don't fit a traditional profile, uh, we're looking at underrepresented students as being a part of that as well. That's a significant push. Uh, even if just yesterday, uh, Obama sort of promoted or cajoled states into adopting what Tennessee's initiative was of uh, two years of free college education for students. And so there, we're getting to a stage where in a learning and knowledge economy, we can't afford to leave a large percentage of society behind. And we certainly can't afford to leave individuals in a poverty state, which is the number one determinant of, of uh, students that won't complete college is, is their income level, not necessarily any other level of academic preparation. So there's a range of other factors that sit there, but that's basically the educational landscape that we face today. Against that backdrop, MOOCs have come about. Um, I don't think MOOCs are, are a trend themselves. I think MOOCs are a symptom of a broader range of factors that have gone on, some of which I've mentioned. The, the uh, diversifying of the university model, the growth of uh, different employment opportunities, the change societally around how individuals acquire their degrees, greater flexibility, the digitization of all aspects of society and ultimately university practices as well. But you know, even now, this is, this is about a year old now. Uh, Currently, if you're looking at student or MOOC numbers, they're sitting in excess of uh, 10 million when you combine, probably approaching about 12 million now when you combine Coursera and edX, which in fairness is actually still less than the global distance learning population. If you look at the distance education institutions, that sits in the 14 to 16 million student range. But nonetheless, uh, MOOCs have come up quickly. Initially, they were hype, and uh, for some startups in particular, they were the, the Rearchitecting of higher education system for universities. Folks at uh, Virginia uh, VCU, for example, uh, uh, got uh, dismissed, as was Teresa Sullivan, because uh, the, the board felt she wasn't moving fast enough on some of these emerging trends. She was eventually rehired when this odd thing of faculty influence came about again. And so end result was uh, and is that uh, MOOCs started off as a strongly hyped transform higher education movement. And today they have really now reflect a completely different segment of learning that we didn't anticipate. So whew, universities will be here for at least the short term. But MOOCs have contributed uh, to a lot of this moving from hype to more recently the backlash. And uh, the, the backlash, I think, is significant in that it helps to, uh, unfortunately, reinforce the mindset of universities as being reluctant to change. Even though if you look at some innovative classrooms, some of the biggest change that's happening isn't technological. And it shouldn't be, really, when you think about it. It shouldn't be, oh, we can teach 200,000 students. That shouldn't be what shapes the future of the university. Instead, it's things like this. It's things where, where universities and colleges around the, the states and internationally are looking at how they teach. 
They're looking at their pedagogical practices and they're saying, this isn't working. We can't have, when we're educating 60% of society, we can't have an education model that maybe meets the needs of 15 to 20% of the brightest folks that can, can succeed regardless of how bad our pedagogy is. All of a sudden, you're starting to see universities say, you know what, we, we can't just lecture at our students. There needs to be more active learning, more active support practices. And so you have initiatives like STEM initiatives that are increasingly relying on active learning, active experimentation, the development of things like maker movements, for example, that helps to promote the development of knowledge through actually doing something rather than the development of knowledge by sitting at the feet of very wise faculty members. And that's also reflected in publications more recently that look at the value of academic or, or active learning that sits across a range of science domains as well. Uh, so quite simply, you know, Seymour Papert and some of the work that he did early on with constructionism and the work that others uh, prior to that have done that emphasize the value of direct and active engagement rather than passive accumulation of information. One of the drawbacks that we have, especially with MOOCs and the many little things that they're spawning now in terms of SPOCs and related initiatives, but one of the drawbacks of MOOCs are that they've really instantiated the worst pedagogical practices and they've allowed us to broadcast and, and export it more effectively. So I think that's, that's a, a big challenge for, that we face and that's why what we're going to start talking about regarding systems like ProSolo and really any, there's a range of other tools that emphasize this but it's that learning needs to be an active, engaged, social process. Learners need to produce artifacts. Learners need to be able to connect and share based on their needs and interests, not just those defined by the faculty member. And I think more importantly, learners also need to be able to create the structure of their own curriculum. Meaning that, yes, you've created a course in whatever topic, but a learner comes by and they've taken a MOOC somewhere else or they've watched a series of TED Talks or just through their own research and exploration. Learners should be able to contribute to the curriculum that we create, not just be recipients of, of that curriculum. So, I mean, this is a blatantly obvious statement, but if you look at universities today, they really don't abide by this very well. We really emphasize just learning that happens at school. And that's what we value. That's what we give recognition for. And yet when you move learning that happens across all spaces of life and across a range of different tools, uh, you start to see a very different picture. Uh, one of the things I think has a potentially interesting or promising opportunity is, and, and what may drive some systemic transformation that we haven't seen yet, in education, or at least not on the scale that some predicted we would end up having, is once we start seeing the credit hour start to crack, if you will. Uh, there's a recent report uh, that was that looked at exactly it's called Cracking the Credit Hour, which looked at some of the challenges of the existing credit hours and ways in which that might change. And that's what you're seeing even now with competency-based education. It puts a lot of pressure on this artificial structure that now really drives much of what we do in higher education. And at this stage, I wouldn't go so far as to say that competency-based or related learning models are going to replace the credit hour. But I would definitely say that we don't have, as I've mentioned, we don't have the traditional learner profile anymore. And because we don't have that traditional learner profile, we also don't have the effectiveness of meeting this emerging learning population through only the format that we have now. So we need to start thinking about diversifying a range of assessment and accreditation op options and that's where some of these activities come in. And that's where the competency-based focus that we're going to be looking at shortly becomes critical. Uh, so this is certainly an area that, as I've mentioned, the, even though the providers now, it's common, you, you know, we point to things like Western Governors University or we look at things like uh, Southern New Hampshire as early leads, but I would say most universities that I've looked at or interacted with over the last year, they at least have something ongoing in competency-based education. Now, if you go back, you know, for folks that have been in this field for a while, in the 70s and the 80s and even prior, uh, competency-based education isn't a thing that arose with technology. It has a fairly long history and often tied to mastery learning as well at some level. But it, really now we're starting to see some tool sets emerging that makes competency-based learning more accessible and also a little bit more effective. When I was at Red River College, we, were, we had a cycle of entirely doing our program in a competency-based model. So you had, as you've seen in other systems likely, but you would get a series of competencies you had to complete. We didn't do a credit hour model. And so you would have to spend time at this station until you completed that competency. You'd get your paper stamped and it might take you a day or it might take you two weeks to do it and then you'd move to the next. Now one of the odd things about students that academics don't share is they procrastinate. 
And so, that was a joke, by the way, academics procrastinate. Anyway, uh, so the, I was just seeing see if you guys were awake. But uh, so, so students, and at the end, all of a sudden, as their, their work or their term was up, all of a sudden, uh, you'd have a group of students that would be panicking to complete the competencies, and they, would, they wouldn't succeed because they were too far behind. So there's challenges there, and we can't overlook those as we start to transition into distance environment. But essentially, uh, there's a range of terms that you've likely heard, especially now that you're seeing more and more the, you know, from the competency-based learning. But we're starting to see personalized learning, adaptive learning, and a range of other terms that are coming onto the horizon. And so whether you're looking at personalization, differentiation, or individualization, uh, the, the broader focus really is on what does the learner do or what does the teacher do and what's involved in that process. And I'd say even more significantly now it's becoming what does the technology do? Like what can the technology that we're using do to help customize the learning process? And, or to help make it personal based on what you already know and what you've already demonstrated to know. So in the past, everything that we were assessed on, we had to intentionally submit and someone had to intentionally mark. I think it's entirely uh, realistic to expect that in the near future, we're going to start to see systems that can analyze quantities of text that we've generated or assignments or artifacts that we've produced and then be able to uh, extract from those specific competencies that are reflected that we've demonstrated in producing those artifacts. And then those competencies can almost be slotted automatically into our learning profile in the same way that any recommendation system on a website like Amazon or Netflix or whatever else starts to build a profile of us that we might not even be intentionally aware of. Um, so I won't go into great detail there. I mean, there's the resources at the bottom if you want to look at it and dive into it in a little bit more detail. But uh, that's sort of the background and the context. Now, uh, Dragon's going to talk about sort of how we envision what education might look like that is, again, research-based, that emphasizes the needs of the learner, but doesn't disrespect entirely the existing educational practices that we have, within which there's a lot that's worth saving, and there's a lot that's worth preserving. Uh, but there's a lot that needs tweaking, and in some cases, uh, broadening of mission and focus. So I'll turn it over to Dragon to talk about how we're currently seeing it. OK, thanks, George. And it's a great introduction. Uh, so once we started designing ProSolo, we basically were driven with a certain set of principles or better principles or mainly lessons learned from existing research and whether we found that research in the literature or we found basically that in our own experiments in the research project George mentioned that we were running in Europe. Uh, so basically the first principle uh, and the a point we wanted to emphasize here is that uh, learning is self-directed and that's basically one of the primary postulates of I would say um, personalized learning. However what we basically realized also is that learners are really not good at self-regulating and self-directing their own learning. Therefore we basically real realized that any new technology should also have strong emphasis on scaffolding and in that sense we basically emphasize the need that we should have instructional, social, and technological scaffolds. And it's basically the ProSolo is the space where we basically have an interplay of these three scaffolding types of opportunities. Another important thing is in that uh, assumption that learners basically um, are self-directed learners is uh, coming from the self-regulated learning research as well. And there are pretty much several principles of that, but Phil Winnie summarized that uh, across three major principles, we are basically here discussing only two. First one is that learners are constructing their knowledge. And when we say that learners are constructing knowledge is really what types of tools they are using when they are studying. And when I say tools, I don't just mean technology, I also mean cognitive tools and I also mean physical tools. So what types of means students are using? For example, whether they are just reading when they are studying, and we know that it's really the least potent study approach, or whether they are, for example, taking notes or using some even more potent study uh, approaches to integrate knowledge, etc. So that's another important point for us. Another important point in that sense is that learners are always agents. And that agency is something which is, I think, heavily uh, underestimated in most of the existing educational context. Meaning that basically learners are always those who are making decisions about their learning. Even if we are having pure behaviorist models of learning, still learners are those who are making decisions about their learning. They are those who are controlling their minds, whether they will stop listening, 
when we are talking to them or not, whether they are going to connect that information with something they already encoded into their knowledge long-term memory, or they will basically be uh, just uh, ignoring that bit of information. So it's really that uh, agency that is something connected with both uh, the level of prior knowledge study skills of learners, but at the same time it's also connected with the motivation and effective states of learners. And that's something really essential for us. In this context, when we understand that learners are agents and that learners are making these decisions, we need to understand also that learners are typically making those decisions based on the uh, conditional knowledge. And that is to say, based on the conditions of their learning, and that is to say, the instructional conditions, the conditions of their current learning, the emotional state, and the level of motivation, they are making those decisions. And therefore, in that sense, it is essential to have a real-time, timely feedback. And out of many of these types of feedbacks, universities are really great at summative feedback. But that's it. And it's done. It's gone. There is no opportunity to recover. And the greatest thing we know about learning is to fail. We learn from failure. And therefore, if we are not allowed to fail and get feedback for our failures, then we are pretty much punished for our failure, failures in the summative feedback type of opportunities. Therefore, for us, the emphasis on process feedback and the formative feedback is a must that these types of technologies need to allow. Another important thing is that given that we wanted to have a focus on competencies and we wanted to decouple and depart from these credit towers, we wanted to have a focus on competencies. However, for us, competency is a social object. And this comes from several, several reasons that are grounded in existing uh, research in uh, educational, uh, different educational contexts. First of all, that general integration, social integration, is the strongest predictor of student retention in colleges. That is to say, if you feel isolated in colleges, then we pretty are much, are much more likely to lose our students than when they are very well integrated with their peers. Once they have the peers, they develop also their structures of support. They develop also structures which are sharing similar attitudes towards certain values. And the moment we are integrated into these structures, and once we start sharing these similar values, then probably we are also sharing similar goals. And therefore, we are much better acquainted also with each other to start even studying together and help each other. At the same time, um, out of many different strategies that are uh, analyzed in many different meta-analysis of online and distance education research, we found that uh, strategies that are encouraging and especially designing student-student interaction are those that are shown to be the most effective for different types of knowledge and learning outcomes for uh, learners. So that, that's why we decided competency is a social object. And the final actually thing which motivated completely our desi design decision was the pilot that we ran at Volkswagen when we had the research project in which we had a completely different design, user interface of our software. It was a research prototype. We were using it mainly for our early thinking. And uh, we also uh, pretty much uh, offloaded a lot of design things on our software engineers who really don't care so much about user experience. I have a right to say that. I'm a trained software engineer. Uh, uh, so I have a right to say that. I spend so much time in software engineering. and. Uh, uh, so we basically offloaded all these things to software engineers who really managed to very well hide all these social streams that are to be used in software. Rather than becoming the central component, they basically became very uh, protected. What we found is basically that they were the central on, central actually feature that affected self-regulated learning processes of our learners who were involved in, in that process. Uh, then another important thing is we need to understand that learners are unique and their learning profiles are also unique. So although we are always making these assumptions uh, on learners as they are on average, uh, and yesterday we discussed with Eric as well, he made a good uh, reference as well, there is no such a thing as learner on average. Nobody is learner on average, but we are always making those assumptions about learners on average. We really need to move from that from a move away from that and basically move away also what is the assumption of credit hours and courses that we presently have. And they are always assuming they are, that students are coming with prerequisites and thus as such they are pretty much equivalent or very similar or, or if not identical to each other. And in this sense 
Uh, ProSolo should facilitate learners that they are unique and they are developing their profiles based on their needs, objectives, and, and career goals. At the same time, learning doesn't happen in a silo. And whether we are talking about silo as a university or whether we are talking about silo as a technological platform, learning is scattered. Learning is happening in many different places. Places, and I hope even today, is a learning opportunity for all of us and even for those who are online, perhaps tweeting more than we are doing this time in the room. But at the same time, although learning is not happening in that silo, learning can be credentialed. And we need to recognize that learning happening outside of our educational box. And that's basically something we need to be emphasizing. However, that credentialing process cannot be just going that learners say, I completed certain activities, but rather has to be very robust, has to be based on some evidence. So learners need to produce some evidence based on which we can validate whether they have certain competencies or not. And the, another important thing which we are often forgetting, uh, institutions are really great universities at generating knowledge. Research is probably the driver of even probably more modern society, but definitely driver also of higher education offering. However, what we are uh, ignoring is in that process is that there, and we are assuming often that there is just a single stakeholder group which is generating and producing knowledge. However, not other stakeholders are allowed to generate that knowledge. And in that sense, uh, institutions, higher ed institutions, but general, many institutions are really not a learning organizations. They are not learning from its experience. They are not learning from the experience of all their stakeholders. It is not possible for an individual learner to contribute directly to the organizational memory of an institution uh, based on their experience so that new learners can pick up on that previous experience and then start learning based on that experience. Therefore, it is basically con a connection of ProSolo that uh, connect learning management systems with also kind of knowledge management system which is happening in the social process. So that's another uh, important component for ProSolo. Having said this, this is the general principle of how ProSolo sees the learning processes happening. Uh, we see, of course, learners as the central uh, element of ProSolo or the central uh, point that ProSolo is concerned with. And learning basically happens as self-directed process. And we see that self-directed process as several phases. Planning process where learners are planning their learning opportunities. They are doing that by either defining themselves their learning goals or they are looking for the opportunities that are provided by the environment, both institutions and their peers. At the same time, learning happens and they are reflecting on their learning. But finally, what we really want to establish for our learners is to have their social presence that they can present what they, they are, where they are, and others can understand what they know. However, there is another layer of that uh, which is surrounding their learning processes. And that is that learners can socialize with other students in the process. And that socialization is not happening just through ProSolo. It can happen through any social media. And ProSolo is serving as an aggregator of that social media. Especially in our afternoon talk, we will talk how we are really aggregating and there are some conceptual models that we developed and implemented for that aggregation. But they are pretty much also building on some of these early constructivist models and the tools such as Grasshopper that are trying to integrate different technologies. But at the same time, they are we are expanding in ProSolo because that integration also goes in real time. It's not just daily uh, uh, digest, which is happening uh, on a periodic basis. Uh, but where ProSolo is actually seeing and fulfilling that space is credentialing. While we are recognizing all these informal learning opportunities and diverse, diverse learning opportunities models, ProSolo is also seeing opportunity to facilitate credentialing. It has a very robust pipeline and the pipeline that can be easily extended with existing uh, educational technologies, but at the same time integrated with the organizational policies. I'm always confusing these two computers. Uh, all right, uh, so I want to always switch in the wrong place. Uh, so what are the technologies that ProSolo is using? ProSolo builds on existing learning technologies, and it can integrate and has integration with many different learning management systems, intelligent Turing systems, through the standard which is called IMS-LTI. Learning technology integration, I think, is the full name of LTI. 
but also pro solo builds on social media. So there is a direct integration with Twitter, um, different RSS feeds, uh, Facebook, or you, whatever other social media you name, pro solo can easily be integrated with. At the same time, pro solo builds on the learning analytics principles so that we can build uh, recommender systems. And these different recommender systems are also deriving from two key elements uh, that we are building. That is machine learning, that we are analyzing different types of activities learners are doing. But at the same time, we are also looking into the products. We are not just interested in the, the counts of activities, because counts don't count so much. Rather, we are interested much more into the actual products of learning. And basically, in that sense, we are also building on information retrieval techniques so that more accurate uh, prediction can be made. ProSolo can be accessed uh, through this URL. So uh, all you need to have to access it is to register with edX. And this will uh, lead you to ProSolo instance that we used during the uh, data analytics, uh, data learn analytics and learning DLA MOOC that we ran earlier, well, late last year. Um, and we basically uh, offered that opportunity there. So you can find this. I'm going to just quickly skim you through some of the screenshots, but you can actually uh, go through the whole process. And I think some of you already had a chance to see the demo that we ran yesterday. We also have uh, a couple of blog posts and video tutorials that are demonstrating in detail the functionality of ProSolo. But uh, as I said, ProSolo uh, is designed to be like a very socially intensive place. And intentionally is designed to have um, a, a look of social platforms that we are very well acquainted because we don't want learners to spend so much time learning new users their interface. So in that sense, uh, learners can have their social updates, status updates. They can post those updates there, but they can also uh, get some of these updates generated automatically. For example, when they complete certain competency or when they complete certain activities, their peers can be uh, getting those updates. At the same time, uh, learners can engage into different social relationships so they can follow each other. And that basically process is similar on like Twitter. And that basically following relationships is asymmetric. So I'm following George, but George may not like me that much. So he's not following me. Or I'm just really just saying something in gibberish. Uh, at the same time, what we also need to do is we need to be intentional in scaffolding these relationships that are happening between students. And research showed that uh, it is not just sufficient to have contextual space for learners that social interaction happens. We need to design those interactions. And in that sense, there are, of course, some of these uh, technological affordances that are scaffolding uh, and encouraging social interactions. Like, for example, we recommend students who to connect with based on the similarity of their profiles. So we do basically their bit of text mining. We do a bit of information retrieval. And then we are building these user profiles. And then we measure similarity between those profiles. So learners can see. Those other learners who are most alike to them and then try to connect with them. We also have based on the recency of the activity. So you don't want to connect with somebody who is not really active recently. You don't want to try to connect with somebody uh, who is not really participating much. You want to get something, someone who is active and who was active recently. At the same time, we also in the DLA MOOC especially wanted to experiment with the scaffolding of individuals who are geographically close. And in that way, the whole intention behind was if you find people who are close to you, maybe you can also self-organize into small groups. And that's been also found in the online and distance education research as one of these effective strategies. There is something that we cannot replace with technology that is so intrinsic and so valuable in face-to-face -face interaction that learners may have. Uh, of course, uh, so ProSolo has now this connection of different types of being called these credentials that learners can enroll. I'm going to talk about in a bit, but these are kind of small dashboards that learners are tracking their progress and they see what, they, what is happening with that. However, learners are also getting certain reminders about some, for example, goals they set up or, for example, additional news. I, for example, set a new goal and that goal becomes a public. Every learner in my network will get a notification that I set a new goal with a pretty much a, an implicit invite to everybody to join me. For example, I want to organize a workshop on learning analytics. 
but I really don't know so much about learning analytics, how to present them to K-12 teachers. So I'm interested to basically partner with people who can help me with that goal. But when we are achieving that goal, we are also going to learn certain things, and we are going to acquire certain competencies. And then basically, this is happening through these feature news. But there is also something which we call daily digest. And that is something that we are harvesting the entire social media around the course or around the whole DLA MOOC based on something that our users told us that they are interested in. And they are telling us basically by simply clicking on their avatars to set up their profiles. So we basically then allow them to connect their different social media accounts and they basically are then being poured into ProSol. And even these social streams can be selected in such a way that I'm also getting status updates from Twitter. And I can immediately in ProSol comment on some of these status updates from Twitter. But what I can also do is I can also connect my blog with this technology. And I really don't have to do that explicitly to integrate anymore my blog here. All other users will get a notification about my new blogs or even comments happening on blogs or any other RSS feed that I may be interested in, they will be all integrated for me. And then for learners, we are then generating these uh, RSS feeds, or we call that uh, daily digests, where they are getting these uh, digests. Obviously, these daily digests, and there is a challenge there to filter them more accurately, because there is often I'm blogging about many different things, but not all these things are relevant for all my peers. So there, therefore, additional exercise for us is to develop different filtering techniques. However, what is also here interesting is I have a seamless way to post that on my status update, but it is also a seamless way to connect these information that I generated to some of the competencies that I'm working on. So I don't have to do anything more but post my blog, and once the, my daily digest picked it, all I need to do is add it to my competencies, and I'm building my profile in that way. Uh, and similarly, I can add it to even many different credentials that I'm following on. Similarly, is happening for different tweets, and that are also being poured into ProSolo. How the process of learning happens? We said the process of learning starts with planning. So learners need to go to the plan tab, and then they will be basically offered uh, a set of, we call these credentials, or small packages of set of competencies. And each credential really looks like a bundle of one, two, up to n, you name it, number of uh, competencies that we would like to our learners to complete. Each of these uh, predefined competencies is something that we can define for our learners. And our learners basically can then uh, enroll in some of these credentials. However, what we also allow for these uh, uh, credentials, they can be also equivalent to courses, if you wish. Uh, and this is the way how we can integrate with existing models, is that we first need to think about the outcome. That, for example, what is that measurable outcome for our learners? If you are talking, for example, about learning about uh, behavior detection, etc. What are those measurable outcomes? Understanding uh, behavior detection is a bad learning outcome. It's not a really competency. We need to look whether students are able to define that and what is then the uh, potential output for that definition. What would the potential evidence students can produce to define, say, a learning analytics field? Uh, they can, for example, generate a blog post in, the, in which they are uh, discussing different perspectives. So that could be one type of evidence that students uh, can provide for that. Once students decide to enroll, enroll in that credential, we are for them creating a space for this credential in the Learn tab. Uh, and then this space is created in this way that they can, first of all, get this whole space, but then they can also get a, and create a small group for themselves. For example, I created uh, this space for me, but I can now in, in, invite George. And this could be also invite for George to enroll into a new course as well. Because George wasn't aware, but he found, oh, this is really useful. I really need it. And two of us know each other so well. So we basically now start working together. And once basically we are enrolling to this course, we are sharing this, we call this like a goal wall, uh, where we basically get updates of each other, what we are working on. I can also see what additional potentially competencies George added into his profile. And I can then that way customize my 
also credential. At the same time, while I'm studying for this credential, I'm basically adding many different activities uh, uh, inside of this uh, credential. Oops. Uh, I can add many different activities, but then we are also building your profile. So we actually recommend you, and the system is recommending you, that you actually collect some more information about your learning, which is expanding beyond what you are having in these competences. So potentially you may have some evidence for additional competencies that you may actually connect with this particular credential. At the same time, learners may create a new competency for themselves. And this is where we see this learning organization. In this way, we can also see the trends that learners are generators of that potential knowledge. In some cases, that doesn't completely work. It's completely against institutional policies or organizational policies. For example, this organization we are working out of Australia, Deakin Digital, for them, this is completely unacceptable. They want to just credential based on the established sets of competencies. But in some other cases, we are really interested to learn these competencies. Why this is actually relevant that learners are creating these competencies or potentially discovering some existing competencies from the organizations is because, for example, different students may have different learning outcome even within the same course. Say nurses, and we had many conversations with many different uh, nursing programs, they have placements. And inside of these placements, one nurse may be uh, exposed to many baby deliveries, while another nurse may have no chance to at all uh, witness uh, baby delivery and participate in that process. So as an outcome of their placement, although they, the same core set of competencies will be identical, this other nurse managed to actually acquire some additional competencies that are relevant and that are personalizing her uh, learning profile. So once this learning process is finished, and learners basically, as an evidence, they can basically upload uh, documents inside of these competencies. They can connect with, to their blogs. They can complete quizzes that are coming, say, out of your institutional LMS. Once that is done, uh, learners basically declare that they are finished, done with learning, and they would like to get that uh, component assessed and credentialed. So they basically go into their profiles and they ask for assessment of their learning. And then basically that assessment can be facilitated in many different ways. It can be done through either peer assessment, it can be based on the institutionally dedicated assessors. Assessment can be even without asking this, if we embedded, for example, some quizzes, then that assessment will be done through the quizzes. Or if we are using, for example, uh, automated essay scoring uh, software, that can be also done that way. And ProSolo will exchange that information uh, through that external uh, software used for that essay grading and return back through LTI as well as an outcome. So that will become, again, part of the user profile, or if you wish, competency-based portfolio of our learners. But uh, of course, assessors can uh, assess that, and this is the form that we have for assessment. Uh, assessors basically see the entire evidence and the outcomes that uh, students had as an outcome of their, uh, as, as learners submitted as an outcome of their learning, they may decide to reject some of these elements. They may provide some comments, which is more part of a formative feedback that we would like to get there. And once they, uh, for example, reject, learners can again start again learning in that process and redo some of these elements based on the feedback they received. And in this process, we also have support for badging. Obviously. This could be further expanded by, say, building of the platforms like you developed here for badging, where we can also see what type of protocol we can use for interoperating these badging platforms so that we really don't care with ProSolo how and what type of badges are out there, but you are actually, as an institution, say we have these badges, ProSolo just imports these badges, and you then automatically assign those badges as a part of the assessment. So this is the big picture. Obviously, when you are playing with software, it's much different than just seeing a few screenshots, but you have an opportunity to do it yourself, and there are video recordings available. So just as a wrap-up, we wanted to point out a few lessons and few directions that we had in mind. So I think George will kick uh, start first. Yes, so uh, thanks, Dragon. And, and obviously, uh, sometimes when you're trying to work through the uh, the particular screenshots of what the software is and what the software does, it uh, can be a bit challenging to grasp exactly how things integrate and pull it together. So as a broad vision, the idea with ProSolo is something that we've been hammering about over the last 
uh, day in a bit when we've been here, but it's that we want to recognize the any place, any space, any tool approach to learning, which means that uh, the obligation of a university going forward isn't going to be to exclusively provide spaces of learning. They may still. But instead, the obligation is to have some sense of respect for existing identities and spaces of learners, and then to make the integration of those spaces a key activity the university engages in. And that's one of the things you start to see with the mindset of ProSolo. Now, part of the adjustment or trying to transition to a new approach, and we were talking about this a little bit yesterday, is sometimes being early is as bad as being wrong, meaning that you can have an idea that does reflect and you know, we think it, it's where education is trending just because of the growing number of tools that are already under our control. Uh, and so the opportunity to implement uh, a technology like ProSolo does require reasonable consideration to what's the organizational culture, what are the scaffolding supports that you need to articulate that allows a student who's starting to use some of these technologies to make that transition from being a student who's used to having content fed to them to a student that is more active and more involved. It's not an automatic transition. It's not an easy transition necessarily because many of us have experienced a traditional learning format since we were in kindergarten. We want to emphasize, though, the idea of technology that's developed together with, its, with, with the users that use the system. So some of the activities that we've been involved with, certainly whether it's running the, the DAL MOOC that we just wrapped up or whether it's uh, pilots that we're running uh, at UTA and, and other possible pilots going forward, it's really about recognizing that effective social software can't be built and then delivered from the mountain to end users. Uh, it has to be built based on what students do with the system and based on the interactions that students have within it. So a lot of attention has to be paid to, to coming to understand the end user experience. Now, the end user experience is, is part of it, but not the exclusive part. Another critical aspect is greater emphasis around using systems that will help to automate activities that learners currently have to do intentionally. Like effective software, especially in learning, needs to do a few things well. The biggest thing I think it needs to do is it needs to recognize what is it that learners need to do for themselves versus what is it that uh, through machine learning or AI approaches you can improve or automate the experience so that you can automatically extract um, learning activities or competencies that have been completed based on what's been done in the system that learners themselves might not even be aware of. You can make yeah, focused, intentional social recommendations as well as related content recommendations that will help to increase the quality of learning for the individual. So that's a second important aspect that we're not going to get into great detail here, but it's certainly for us an important aspect that we improve the quality of the automatic presentation of related competencies or social connections. We do want to very much emphasize that uh, our vision, if you will, of universities and education going forward isn't one that's teacherless, and it's certainly not one that is uh, driven by clever algorithms exclusively. It's one that's driven by very much a human context where the role of the educator and the faculty member as, as a mentor, almost an atelier type, type of learning model, remains critical. And learners themselves have greater control over that process and that experience so that they're active participants in the learning experience, not just in terms of what they're learning, but in terms of actually defining the scope and the space of the kinds of things that they're starting to learn. And so we really want to emphasize the importance of the learners being in control and learners having the ability to be self-directed and uh, interest-driven in that regard. Um, I think at this point I'll pass it back to, to Dragon to continue wrapping uh, up this section of it. Thanks, George. This is another topic George and I actually discussed very much. In, in when, when we started the DLA MOOC, in which we didn't just use ProSolo, we also used the edX platform, uh, we basically uh, de designed a course to basically have this so-called dual layer. And I think George will be talking much more in the afternoon today about that. But the whole point was that we wanted to say that inside of FedEx, students will have a very streamlined a platform very structured and in ProSolo it will be very self-directed. And then in addition to that we told students you can also use your own spaces for learning. We don't care if you are not using either of these two platforms. If you say you own your blog or if you are on whatever else you prefer to, to work. Uh, and we basically told students find the pathway which works the best for you and just stick with it. What we found is for students, a majority of them, they found the platform or the pathway that worked the verse for them and they started uh, ranting about it. And basically it seems that there is a huge external locus of control for many learners in that process. And 
And this is something we really need to account for if we are going with these types of programs. How we are going to deal with this uh, external locus of control. So ProSolo can support self-directed learning. Some learners really loved it and enjoyed it, but for some other learners it was really difficult to figure out what to do. Therefore, we really need to think through carefully additional types of scaffolds that we can provide to learners to mitigate this need for external um, locus of control. But of course, do we really want to develop uh, self-directed learners or even university graduates who are having so uh, well emphasized external uh, locus of control? We even had many faculty members who were enrolled into our uh, course who were actually one of those, one of the, those very loud uh, uh, proponents of external locus of control and clarity what to do and how to find their ways. So this, this is another really big challenge for not only uh, ProSolo as a technology, but just basically as a big educational uh, challenge for us. Obviously, it has to do with the level of metacognitive skills that uh, uh, we are teaching and our students have. We know from existing literature on self-regulated learning in general that the level of metacognitive skills of learners on average is rather low. Learners are typically using very inefficient study strategies, and more so, I think we don't really have that culture that we are learning how to study. Or we really are always expecting fish, but we really don't want to learn how to fish. And th this is something that institutions in many cases became something that basically turned out uh, that we don't really develop type, type of culture. So how do we go there? I find, for example, when I was in Australia, I spent last couple of years, almost two, nine, ten months in Australia in many different institutions, I quite like their focus on so-called graduate qualities. And these graduate qualities or graduate attributes are something uh, that is basically going beyond uh, just simple content knowledge of learners. So for example, learners to be self-directed learners or they have strong information skills, strong communication skills, uh, ethical um, citizens of the world and, and so on. So how do we develop these types of skills inside of universities and in a way how we can even scaffold learning these uh, study skills? So some of the research we've done in that process is like, you know, we need to have these so-called externally facilitated like, uh, regulated learning. And some of the processes that can be done in that sense is that we really don't and we cannot go with simple behavioral uh, standards as the ways how we are guiding students. So for example, you need to submit 10 uh, discussion posts. It means nothing. Students will sum submit 10 discussion posts. They will not care about the content and the quality of the content. And our research basically shows without increasing at all external motivation for students in terms of the grades, for example, for online discussions, when they get a good scaffold about the quality of the discussions, they significantly expand the quality of their discussions, for example, in terms of we measure that in terms of the level of cognitive uh, presence, but in many other ways. And more importantly, we also find that that scaffold actually moderates the association of the quality of these discussions and the amount of these discussions and engagement with the final learning outcome. Meaning that students, when we ask them to discuss and the quality of the discussions was very low, uh, some of these indicators or most of these indicators were not associated with the grades at all and some of them were actually even as negatively associated with the final outcomes. Meaning we found, for example, the number of times students say thank you to their peers was really negatively associated with the final outcomes. It would be also with the Canadian culture where we are saying thank you and sorry for almost everything uh, and has no meaning. But in a way it tells us that if learners are really just asking a question and thanking for the answers, they're really not deeply engaging into those conversations. This is just one example. So students really are fine deeply engaging, but they don't know how to do so. And that's the big thing. And they don't need the quantity how many times they need to qualitative scaffold to tell them this is the type of a message that you need to submit. And they are actually then doing really well. They go even three or four times more beyond that expectation of the quality standards. Could you say a little more about role assignment? Uh, role assignment is basically something that is uh, coming from the CSCL research, Computer Support Collaborative Learning Research. It basically, uh, the current uh, theory or its emerging theory in that field is called uh, scripting. So we basically need to provide different types of scripts. And there are many different models that are available there. However, it seems that there are, uh, uh, that there are certain roles that are much, uh, in much better place to learn 
uh, than other roles. So for example, the role of summarizer in some of these discussions has been shown to be really effective. While, for example, that uh, information seeker or devil advocate or etc., they are not really so effective on the final learning outcomes of, of learners. Uh, at, at the same time, it's also been shown that the moment where certain roles are assigned temporarily, it's so important. So, for example, if some learners were assigned to the role of summarizer in the beginning of the course, they profit much more uh, than the learners who get that role assigned, say, in the mid of the semester. And therefore, basically, the problem of the role assignment can be equity and how equitable these role assignments are. So we experimented, actually, where each learner owns their own thread and basically becomes both moderator and the summarizer in these discussions, while all these other students are supposed to be devil advocates, uh, information seekers, and also uh, we call them innovators, where they basically need to hypothesize some new solutions. Like it's building off of the research on reciprocal teaching. Yes, exactly. And so students are pretty much rotating those roles and these cycles of rotating roles are really short. So they don't wait like five weeks for learners, but many cases we actually experimented in these discussions to happen in, within three weeks. And in each week, each student would be playing dual roles, right? So, so that, that, that was one of those elements. Obviously, we talked about machine learning and text mining is really useful for some of these technological scaffolds. And we even found when we analyzed logs, we didn't still uh, get to, to this level of granularity to analyze different micro level uh, self-regulated learning processes. But we, when we analyzed that with Volkswagen, we found, for example, as I said, social wave or these social streams to be the most central element that was associated and was leading to some of these uh, uh, engagement in some of these uh, micro level uh, self-regulated learning processes. We also found that a recommendation of the learning pathways, what to study next, was also highly uh, effective. This was not appreciated. It was also appreciated through the self-reports of learners, but this is based on the trace data and the instrumentation that we had behind the scene. And also, uh, a recommendation of confidence was very important for learners for planning of their learning activities. So recommendation is really affecting very much the planning phase. It does not affect so much the uh, reflection phase or the learning phase itself, but it's more like what to study next is something where we see the opportunities. But of course, no technology is a silver bullet. And while we are, of course, willing that ProSolo can offer some of these technological affordances that are providing certain scaffolds, we still believe that instructional design is the central and the most potent agents, agent that is driving the activities of learners inside of these processes. We need, and we, I just mentioned some of these pedagogical approaches. I'm pretty much uh, experimenting with many, many different uh, externally facilitated and regulated uh, regulation approaches where we are providing students with the standards they need to use to qualitatively assess the products of their learning as the way how to engage in that process. But of course, uh, there should be, and we are leveraging in that process uh, other learners, and we saw in ProSoil as well, how they are quickly jumping to connect with each other when they are working on certain competencies or activities, but at the same time, instructors have easy access to any of these things. And if we are talking even at the instructional, at the institutional level, present models that are available, we can see ProSolo being used in class where this, the instructor could be one of these group members uh, available there. Obviously, as I said, instructors still can and should have a central uh, role in this process. However, they can now interact with students in many different, in diverse contexts. It is not anymore just this classroom or big silo platform. I can quickly get updates what my students are doing if they are willing to share that with me from different social media to these types of elements. So in, in that sense, uh, instructors are just empowered with technology, but they are still tailoring uh, that experience. Uh, and in this process, we really see kind of this metaphor de developing while we can see some of these cool things like, which was uh, shown in the, uh, in the movie Moneyball, where some of these analytics technologies can be used and we can optimize even different teams and identify ideal students. We still can use our old fashioned sense making that is available in tacit knowledge of many of our instructors, which is shown in the Trouble with the Curve movie, 
uh, another two, uh, another movie about baseball. I have no idea uh, about the rules of baseball, but I'm talking to the U.S. audience. I'm sure we are really well acquainted. Although I watched the movie and I figure probably that I understood what's trouble uh, with the curve, but I still don't quite understand how that affects the overall game. Now, so in any case, uh, what, what we are seeing is that this uh, credentialing is a big opportunity for many institutions and something that institutions should look very carefully. How we can credential something which is not credit hour, but something smaller, granular unit, and something which was learned outside of that big university silo. To do so, we need to have different institutional policies, whether those are policies uh, just about the grading, about the assessment, or they are also state-driven in terms of the standards, or even professionally driven, which is the case for some professions such as nursing. Uh, but of course, the question, given that we are suggesting a new model of learning, we need to also think carefully how we can restructure existing educational resources around competences. And I think I already reflected in the presentation as well that we can piggyback already in existing models that are available in resource institutions. But for example, we can use learning outcomes as one of these uh, starting points from which we can then say, well, you have these learning outcomes. Now we are going to structure all your learning resources and, uh, and the assessments around these outcomes rather than these resources are first class citizens in your uh, uh, presentational and instructional process. I'm pretty sure in that process we will quickly realize how poorly designed many courses are and we will quickly also realize how uh, inadequately many assessments are aligned with the learning outcomes that they claim to be assessing or promoting. That will be another challenge that could be potential. That's right. Uh, in Precisely. And on the other hand, like, you know, in a way we hope that ProSolo and the technology like ProSolo can even uh, scaffold instructional process as well, that instructors actually think first about the outcomes and assessment rather than just the pieces of content and then just to come up with something that they can assess rather than they, they are assessing precisely what they are claiming to assess. And of course, we need to integrate with many different content and competency frameworks that are out there that we can import those frameworks into ProSolo and we facilitate easy interoperability with ProSolo. At this point, I'm gonna stop and happy to engage into further conversation with you. So if I could just um, jump in. Thank you so much, uh, Dragon and George, for your input. Um, two quick points I'd like to make is if you have a question and you're joining us online, uh, you can post your question and either Kyle and I will sort of track it and we'll translate it for our guests. And if you're in the room, please uh, wait until you get the microphone so that our guests can hear us uh, externally. So, so with that, uh, anyone want to lead off with a question? Oh, oh sorry. Oh, you got two? Oh, we'll go to Marcella. Well, Kyle, do you want to read the ones over? Yeah, we go to Marcella first okay. and then we'll bring the questions. Sounds good. So um, I found it actually quite uh, exciting that you actually talked about the metacognitive challenge because I think that that's one of the biggest issues facing MOOCs right now. Um, and the fact that you brought up CSEL and the scaffolds and scripting is also interesting as well. But have you um, looked into, once you incorporate scripting or if you find ways of incorporating scripting to provide externalized metacognitive scaffolds, um, how will you then minimize or fade those so that the students can internalize these scripts rather than just always being dependent on an externalized scaffold to, to be told how to think and what to do? That's a great question and I think that's the question of the whole scaffolding literature basically fading away scaffolds whether we are talking about scripting whether we are talking about any types of scaffolds. Uh, I think in that sense there is no single answer but what I'm actually thinking is in that sense given that we are leveraging this technology is that we need to move away from simple uh, so-called cross-sectional or within or between subjects studies to more longitudinal types of studies where we are really tracking a single learner for a set period of time and where we are actually uh, able to first of all we don't even know what is the right moment to do that we don't know that from the educational research literature that's a simple answer we don't know that that's why I'm seeing these types of opportunities uh, as ideal to set up that research agenda and also integrate into 
some kind of uh, design-based research. We are basically learning what is happening there. And then once we learn that sufficiently, we can then propagate that back to the new learners who will be going through a similar learning experience in the future. So that's how I'm seeing that process. Uh, but of course, we know how basically bad it could be if we continue adding that scaffold. And we know that expertise reversal effect and the work that done, which, which was done by Slava Kaliuk out of uh, University of New South Wales in that sense. So if you persist that scaffold, it can become eventually uh, negatively associated with the final learning outcomes. So that's a great point. So we have a comment from Ipeng. He's saying that he's noticed that meaningful feedback is challenging to some teaching practices, like uh, you know, for faculty and assessors to provide feedback. And he's wondering how much, and how frequent feedback should be, uh, you know, in, in computer-based learning and, and in prior learning assessment. You know, and how how much and how often feedback, and how do you make that? I think with feedback in particular, it's hard to, outside of a context, outside of knowing the state of a particular learner, uh, it would be hard to answer in a generic sense. Because if you have a student who's early on in, in uh, exploring a new topic area, then I would say feedback should be more frequent than if you're looking with a student who's a bit further along, a little more established, a bit more comfortable with it. And also a student that has an existing social network around them that can provide feedback too. We found quite effective interactions and, and the research around the, the distance, uh, uh, the, the research that you get within certain spaces that emphasize how uh, feedback is best provided and promoted for individual students, I think is pretty clear on, on the uh, benefit of error and fact checking in discussion forums or that can happen on blog posts or other activities as well. So I think first of all, so just to muddy the question, First thing you need to know, the context, the learner, the experience of the learner before you can really start to look at how much feedback is needed. Second thing, it's about the type of feedback that's required, whether it needs to be instructor feedback or whether it can be feedback that comes through a peer process as well. Obviously, uh, the, uh, another aspect is what can be technologically utilized for effective feedback. This is something that MOOC providers have been quite active in doing. Unfortunately, uh, the, the feedback is, is almost interruptive to the learning process. So if you've taken, let's say, a course on Udacity, you watch a minute video and then you answer some Q and, you know, multiple choice Q&A. Uh, and that's not necessarily substantive or even uh, effective feedback, I think, other than low level basic knowledge evaluation. So short answer is there's really no generalized response that you can provide around what's the best approach to handle feedback. I would agree and I would add to that that uh, if you do all those, uh, if you consider all the right factors, The answer is always going to be more than the instructors can provide, <laughs> which is one of the reasons I really like your, your approach is that you can attach, you can send that product, that evidence you have, out to multiple people. Yeah. And you can ask for peer, you can elicit, and peer feedback becomes part of that self-directed learning. I understand it as a learner participating in this process, but part of my job is to you know, understand and produce evidence, and another part of my job is to look at the evidence that other people produce and to give that a meaningful review, and that there's learning of value there. So I think one of the things I really like about the direction you're headed is that you know, your system, and, and you're looking at machine feedback too, I mean, you're looking at that, but, but harnessing the power of the self-directed learners, I think is, is the way we might approach an appropriate amount of feedback. I have another question from Alan. I was wondering about in the, uh, the download uh, where you use ProSolo, have you done any analysis of the demographics of learners that might be correlated to that bias for specific external control? In other words, if, when people say, uh, I want external control, uh, are there certain demographic features that would allow you to predict who those people who want external control is, or is it pretty much across the board? Uh, you know, honestly, we haven't done that type of analysis. It'll be really cool to do that. But the, there is the, the deal in terms of the method that we would use for that. We didn't really use any instruments for measurements, so we didn't use like any pre-course survey for external or for measurement of locus control. We will do that next time. 
we use some addition, ad, other types of instruments. We didn't really anticipate that extent of the external locus of control. But what we can actually do is we have so plan many different messages that were submitted by learners. And that could be really interesting, but requires as any qualitative research method requires much more time than to collect these type of data. And the course just finished uh, three weeks ago. So that will be definitely something we are very keen to pursue. And it's worth emphasizing there's a, there's a range of uh, overlap uh, topic areas at least that arise when you start looking at what's the current focus on this idea of persistence in learning, uh, grit, and other attributes that determine why is it that a student continues in the face of some difficulties versus where another student might, might drop out. So even when you start looking at, at concerns around external locus of control, it's important to understand the contextual elements that might be around that, that it's not just, you know, you're a person who likes to blame people around you. I mean, that's, there's more to it, and there's overlap with other aspects of literature that I've already started to address, how certain mindsets, whether you're looking at, you know, the work that Ruth Deacon Crick has done in this regard, or Carol Dweck and others, uh, there are important topics to be considered that go beyond the, especially if you're trying to improve a locus of control that's internal and uh, self realized, if you will, that does require better understanding rather than speaking about it as in there are certain students who just blame others. And, and, and there is really something in it as well in terms of mind growth and uh, Carol Dweck's research in, in the sense like, uh, I mean, there are already existing studies looking into the association between external locus of control and different uh, 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 mind growth uh, facets. However, what, what is also recently shown in one recent study by um, uh, Robert Bjork out of uh, UCLA as well is <coughs> in terms of these study uh, tactics, that students who are much more inclined towards these mind roads, they believe that they are flexible and they can be developed, they are also much more inclined to use more efficient, more effective study tactics and study approaches. So I, I, I would then say that pro by promoting pretty much development and uh, moving away from these fixed uh, mindsets, uh, to more flexible and growth mindsets would also be probably an approach which will be also leading students to easier than deal with the new challenges and they are expecting to uh, accept new types of tools and new types of uh, approaches to learning. That, that's one really important uh, thing. The other important thing, and I'm going to return back again to feedback as well, uh, obviously feedback the more the merrier, especially the more precise it is. However, I think there are several levels of that feedback. At a certain point, while you can have great instructional feedback for your student, at a certain level, that student may be so frustrated to be giving up. And we need to also account for these effective states as well. And at some point, that counseling needs to go at that level as well, to uh, treat a student as a human, and basically these effective states as a human being, what can they affect them? And to what a point that even though that is a perfect, great, uh, researchly rob robust, proven, a feedback still may not work simply because of the uh, emotional state that our student ended up because of these continuous errors. I was uh, expecting radical ideas, but not by treating students as you like. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so it seems like uh, ProSolo was designed for online interactions uh, but is, there, is it also what are your thoughts on using it uh, in an in-person classroom for um, both allowing students to uh, define some at least some of their own competencies if not all and also for um, facilitating group formation especially in classes where there's you know, 200 students in person? Uh, I would say absolutely uh, the origin of pro solo comes uh, from this research project that I mentioned and research project had to do nothing with higher ed and with online education. Research program was uh, workplace focused. And the uh, primary uh, uh, objectives of that pro project were harmonization of individual and organizational <coughs> objectives and increased responsiveness of organizations to individual needs. In our studies, we pretty much wanted to support workplace learning and knowledge management. And we, when we deal with, for example, Volkswagen, uh, for them was really to support knowledge management within a, a car seat design department in Volkswagen in Germany. People who are sharing basically the same 
physical space, but just to document what they are doing and to form the groups, to document the formation of those groups precisely, and to exchange and increase the level of that uh, so-called peripheral group awareness. And that's what ProSolo builds on. And so I think that uh, you know, following up on that just on a, on a topic or a generalized ideal is that uh, it's this idea of any space learning, any tool learning. So whether that's uh, physical, you know, in class, but even then in class experiences rely more and more on technologies than uh, you know, even in the past. So it's where you walk into a classroom and there's no digital traces left of that. So whether you're using something, let's say, as basic as clickers or you're doing something a little more involved where you have students do collaborative work outside of the classroom that follows on with it, the general idea is if you were learning something somewhere, uh, you can cast it as a social competency within, within uh, Pro Solo. I think the cultural elements of educational processes are, are reasonably well understood in, in the, certainly the importance of recognizing different ways of knowing that are valued and understood within different cultures. The, uh, so that's something that we haven't looked at extensively though, is how do you, let's say, work with students who might come, you know, hypothetically, if, let's say from an Asian country where they've been accustomed to having a fairly strong uh, respect for the educator and now you're asking them to see their peers and uh, the educator in a different light. And you're asking where in the past they've assumed that what your task as a learner is, is to learn in a more traditional, you consume content rather than create way. Uh, and there, there's some theories around this idea, whether it's community formation, otherwise this idea of legitimate peripheral participation that you might be familiar with, uh, Lev and, uh, and uh, Wenger's work. Those are, are elements that we can't ignore. You know, namely the impact or the, the different preferences on the part of learners that are culturally based. So yeah, on the one hand, you have to respect that different cultures and different ways of knowing are going to exist in any kind of university system. Some cases they'll be pretty dramatic. Other cases they'll just be small variations. You just have to recognize or at least be aware of that. A second aspect, though, that comes out of it is that, as we've talked already about competency-based learning, we're not saying that this replaces what we're doing now. Uh, we're saying that the education pie, if you will, has grown over the last several decades. The number of students participating has changed. The profiles of those students has changed. Internationalization is certainly a factor. So what we're saying is this is one way to look at the learning process to something that's better aligned with these multi-space learning activities that we now engage in. And also the fact that a growing portion of our graduates are going to keep returning to the university over the duration of their lifetime. So that means, uh, this is what we tried to do with the with uh, DALMOOC, where we had a dual layer approach. We recognized that for different students, there's going to be different requirements and needs. So we had a structured layer, which was just like a regular course. You could be a student who reads and consumes content in a more passive way. Uh, you don't have to contribute anything, but you can go through that pipeline and still get recognized for the work that you've done. Now, if you are more involved or more interested in collaborating and contributing, then you can move to a second pathway, which was the competency framework. Our assumption was, and we'll see as we go forward and start looking at the data more so, that students will move in between these two layers because there's value in both layers. There's value sometimes in hearing an expert explain a topic to you, but there's also value in then taking some of those ideas and working with them yourself. But a lot more thinking needs to be done into the cultural dimensions of different pedagogical models. Terrific. Um, I've got one that I'd like to go back to uh, regarding to Pro Solo, and it has to do with the definition of competency and um, sort of empowered. I, I think in, in the system right now, I saw that the individual can create a competency, we say create a competency. Um, what if I create a competency that no one else really values or, or views as a, as a positive uh, thing? 
Is, is there a place here where we may have, say, an association, Association of Engineering in X, Y, and Z, who says these are the competencies for this industry? Um, might that be a level where I, I would guess that the institution can also say, here are the competencies for this type of degree? How do you sort of wash that out when you, no. when you, when you have both the individual all the way up through organizations able to define a competency? It's a great question. I think there you're going, and once again, you're going to see layers. So let's say I'm a student that uh, enrolls at uh, Penn State, and I'm going to start taking a competency-based program with you. Well, obviously, you've done the work with your industry partners, or you've done the work with other faculty members to articulate the competency structure of that program. Uh, so I will largely follow the competency framework that, that you've established. I may peripherally look at developing a few additional competency statements myself so I can contribute to it. But by and large, you're the lead and I'm following your lead as a, as a learner. It, on the other hand, if let's say Penn State has an arrangement where you're going to do some training uh, or certificate or even degree development with, let's say, IBM. Well, IBM is going to have some clear competency requirements on their end. So they're going to come by and give you, let you know these are the competencies we need of graduates. And you're going to layer over the Penn State competencies that you think are critical for a graduate to have. And then still have opportunities for learners to participate. So I think really the, the need of the competencies are determined by the, the, the stakeholders that are involved in it. And it's going to be different in different contexts. Nursing competencies, for example, they're well-defined nationally, in some cases even internationally. So you could largely take an existing competency framework from, from nursing organizations or professional organizations and follow that. Uh, so it'll vary based on who are the stakeholders and also what are the, the outcomes that are intended from that uh, learning experience. I think it would be a great source for program development to, to have learners adding their own competencies. So if you're preparing people for role X, they're adding these other competencies. I go, oh, you know, I, I had no idea. Yeah, that's a really good one. That should be in there. So whether hmm. it's a professional association that defines the competency set, I would think that seeing what learners add to that base set would be a, a remarkable asset for the, the owners of the competency set. And the, this is precisely the reason we didn't really look at it from the perspective when we designed the technology itself from the universities. But this is exactly right, what you are saying. But when we look at it from the workplace as well, many organizations have their own competencies and they are associated typically with different positions they have in their organizations. However, those organizations grow, their roles are changing continuously, right? And especially those changes are not happening because their bosses tell them to, to change, but simply they are changing because they are typically knowledge workers and they are typically coming up with new solutions and they are realizing that there are new needs for solutions. So for example, like, uh, in late uh, uh, 1990s, Java was a merging technology, but very few developers were on the market there. Therefore, those who were the first ones were those who documented and established the new, these new competencies in the software development organizations. I'm, sim I'm pretty sure in any creative industries, it's a similar process, but it's not, I'm sure, just in creative industries. I would even say like in, in medicine or whatever, there are so many different new practices that are established or a lot of new knowledge is generated that is typically not easily translated into practice. And by generating these new competencies and documenting them and making them easily and readily available to others to apply them, in new context and enrich them, that's basically the place where ProSolo can help or the technology like ProSolo can help. Yeah, thank you very much. A very stimulating presentation. Um, I want to pick up on the competency thing, and you were just um, stating it in terms of, you know, there's some underlying practices that um, start to have to be in place often. Uh, we see in K-12 education a shift in math education and science education which is looking more and more at the integration of practices. So it's not teaching concepts independent of the use of those concepts, for example. So there's certain practices that have to be in place. Systems thinking, model-based reasoning, quantitative reasoning. As examples, there's many, many more. Um, and and, and that's, that's an important place where um, the mediation of learning needs to occur. And it's interesting to think about how that occurs across the analysis of your learning pathway. Because that's going to be not only within a course, it's going to be between courses yep. or between learning calls, right? Yep. And so you can track um, some of the complexity of the dimensions 
or the places where people get stuck. The point you were making earlier, Kyle, about you know the feedback that teachers and professors are going to give. Um, I think that uh, I think that's a whole other area of research where you're going to have to look at the professors because I liked your point that you made about um, you know, that the faculty have a, have a big responsibility of being in, in a sense in control of the profile of the supports. You know, the, it's going to be the faculty. I assume they're going to be the ones with, through the data analytics that. You know, you're going to form your groups, and, um, and and also part of the group formation. When you were talking about, um, you know, things being alike and geographically close, um, I know from my experience in the classroom that one of, there are times when you want to put kids in groups who don't think exactly the same way, so yeah. they can have at it, yeah, and and do some some of that convincing um, with each other. But um, le but let me I want to ask one particular question, and it has to do with the instructional interactions with students, and it, it picks up on the point about the classroom. Um, we know that there's various scales to these things, in the thousands of students, the 10,000, down to the hundreds, down to the ten. And mediation and feedback opportunities are going to be substantively different, in my mind, if, if that's the case. Um, so how do, how, do we, um, how do we get the faculty, and again, this is part of the research question, how do we get the faculty to be able to get the right information, to be able to get back to the learners in ways that are productive. What are we learning about that? Yeah. I can take you. Sure. Sure. I mean, uh, th th those are great points. What you are suggesting, and uh, indeed, and the role of instructors. And I think we yesterday discussed that with Kyle, George, and I, I think Larry was there as well when we dis discussed that. Basically, that content is not really anymore. The, issue and why would we, we would be spending all so much time on designing or creating new content when it's out there available and we just need to r just uh, wrap it up around some new ideas or concepts or even leverage what our students are finding and using. So, uh, so the role of instructor is really to provide that uh, instruction, feedback generation. And obviously when we have a small group of students you really don't need even so much technology, up to 10 students. The moment you have a class of 30, 40 students, it's not anymore that easy. You cannot know, even when you are a lecturer, even like with 10 students, you cannot really know what's really in the minds of all of your students, even if it's this small group like we have today. Uh, but uh, the, the question with that scale and increase is something where we see the use of learning analytics. And the moment we are leveraging uh, technologies like learning analytics <coughs> is allowing us for opportunities also to learn better about learners. And this is the idea that George likes to call uh, knowledge graphs. And we yesterday uh, call, uh, discussed that idea of personal knowledge graphs, in which we will, will not only know what is the knowledge state of our individual learners based on the uh, certain set of assessments, but we will also know the set of uh, learning strategies they followed to get to that state. Uh, we will also know who they worked with and what information they used so in that the process. the design of your assessments has to be very powerful. To actually get the or, or your the your ability to infer from data or to operationalize data signals in a way that allows you to create a f framework that would need to be reasonably developed. Yeah. I mean, if we're going to get a deep knowledge and deep learning, right, and not like you said, you know, just the, sort of the multiple choice kinds of things with Udacity, yeah. then the performance tasks that we design have to be robust enough to allow us to see some of these um, higher level cognitive practices that have taken place. Well, I mean, I, it's all very challenging and exciting. It's, yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the opportunities as well when you start to look at, I mean, there's, Educational institutions have a terrific range of innovations that they've right. utilized that often don't get scaled or don't get shared. So one example is just the value of, uh, of doing co-op learning, you know, where you're in an industry or an authentic context. So I think when you're looking at assessments and assessment opportunities, relevance and authenticity are sort of the first two things that come to my mind at least, is that if you really want to know what a student knows, you almost have to, well, you do need to have them in a context where they're able to practice the thing that you want them to learn and observe. And, and, so, and there's a range of ta tactics around that that go beyond just simply telling or, or providing an answer. So for example, one of the things we did with Dalmook was Carolyn Rosé has done some interesting work uh, with, uh, with what she's calling Bazaar, uh, which, uh, uh, which is the use of a, 
I guess an intelligent agent or virtual Carolyn, as it's called, where where she uh, you you frame a series of questions that are based sort of this idea of I guess accountable talk kind of principles, where you're leading yeah. people yeah. through certain processes of understanding a topic, and so uh, that's a, right. Yeah, out of Pittsburgh. So obviously Carolyn's with, with CMU. Uh, so she's done quite a bit of work with with it, and we use it in the, in the MOOC. And so students that used it were uh, the experience of having someone lead you through a reflection process post learning. Even though it was a virtual assistant, was uh, was actually quite surprisingly effective for the students and empowering as well because you were able to clarify thoughts and ideas that you might have had that you've never really questioned your assumption. And so, in a certain regard, you know, both Wittgenstein and uh, Vygotsky had this odd statement, which uh, you know they're often not compared, but it's this idea that language gives birth to thought. Yep. And so, the viewpoints there were with and this process is that once you're asked to take something that has, in Wittgenstein's language, this occult character of thought. Once you're asked to make that external, then all of a sudden all those little trappings that it connects to nebulously in our mind become clear and it collapses to the thing that we've said. And that's why a virtual assistant and going through that process of reflection I think is so powerful because it forces us to clarify. Right, and on, on that hand basically then analysis of text and analysis of language is so important and powerful. We, we've been doing some work, obviously Carolyn Rosé is probably one of the leading risk scholars in, in that space, especially in, with the application in computer support collaborative learning uh, space where they developed even a tool called LightSci, which allows even regular instructors to basically analyze text. But we are also seeing some of these measures that are coming from old research from even from the 70s and which is involving our gracer etc and the tools such as Cometrics where we basically can look for example the level of cohesiveness of students uh, language and that level of cohesiveness is typically associated also with a higher level of uh, cognitive reasoning that students put and the other element in that process is and we also found that as well in our research is if you now go further on and look for the topics students are discussing inside of those say essays or whatever else they are discussing and looking then for the level of density of the graphs of the connections of some of these concepts then we can also again infer deeper level of integration of that information than when we have these topics loosely connected or even we can identify even misconceptions by connecting some of these concepts which should not be connected at all or they are connected via some other concepts. So the, the uh, machine learning techniques and natural language processing is something which we are paying so much attention to and we are seeing great source for uh, providing next generation of assessment. On the, uh, in the conversation online, there's been a complimentary conversation among remote participants about the uh, tool and your presentation, and an invitation from Alan to uh, publish your work in the current issues and emerging e-learning journal. Uh, they, they find some of the things you're talking about fascinating and say, wow, we'd love to publish some of that out there. And for colleagues here at Penn State, I think there are opportunities to work on that. And I'd like to say that one of the purposes of uh, visit by George and Dragon is to introduce us to Pro Solo and it looks as though we may be able to pilot that in uh, courses here uh, and develop a, a relationship where we provide some good uh, you know, input and, and use and, and really uh, sort of start thinking together about this tool and about perhaps other tools as well. Which leads me to the next, uh, an invitation to the session after lunch. Uh, after lunch today at 1.30 will, uh, in Foster Auditorium in the Paternal Library, we will be uh, asking our presenters to do one last thing for us, uh, which is to uh, talk about their vision of the future of education. Where is education going? And what kinds of tools uh, might be useful in, in supporting the kind of emphasis on learning that they see? So with that, uh, I'm not turning off the lights and throwing you out of the room, but we are going to end the online conversation, uh, thanking people for their participation and stop the recording, and off we go. So again, thank you, George. Thank you, Greg. Thank you.